Okay. Uh, we'll uh, start our discussion. Uh, we started uh, discussing about uh, the the economic analysis of financial regulations, and also uh, we probably able to start uh, the discussion of uh, the central banking, particularly the U.S. Federal Reserve, and with that, uh, some comparison with respect to Central Bank of Sri Lanka in uh, today's discussion. And, uh, and of course, uh, 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 we have uh, very clearly recognized in our last discussion also the importance of uh, information and where most of the difficulties with respect to uh, uh, financial markets arise from asymmetry, asymmetry of information. And, and regulations try to uh, uh, reduce or minimize the asymmetry and other possible misbehavior by market participants. And you probably uh, uh, got a kind of a feel about so-called safety nets. But then safety nets uh, also has its own element uh, in terms of uh, uh, a moral hazard and adverse selection, right? So when you see that the net is there, that you are a little careless in terms of uh, 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 dropping things outside your window, right? But if there is a complete uh, uh, a kind of a punishment kind of arrangement, you'll probably be a bit different in your behavior. So it's no different when it comes to financial markets also. But then the financial markets are one of the most uh, 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 sought after, if not, uh, uh, if you look at among regulations, financial markets see most of the regulations compared to other economic activities. So you see this safety net, uh, which has so-called moral hazard, okay? And then uh, the other element is adverse selection, okay? Uh, 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 and this also needs to be looked at uh, when we are introducing so-called safety nets, uh, in our uh, uh, exercise uh, in terms of uh, analyzing economic analy analysis of financial regulation. So this is where we stopped. Any question before I move on uh, for the uh, uh, greater details of discussion? Right, so we'll move on. If you have questions, you can uh, highlight it. You can raise it. Uh, uh, in the check uh, mode, so we can also look at it. So you see the safety nets, uh, which also uh, uh, has the so-called moral hazard component, okay? Uh, 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 where you see moral hazard happens when one, take, one person takes more risk because someone else bears the burden of those risks. And, and effectively, this happens in financial uh, uh, contracts, financial markets, simply because uh, uh, financial markets tend to uh, 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 work in a manner where pooling of resources and then uh, 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 you have learned from your uh, uh, discussions in uh, indirect finance where finance is coming from a third party. It's not your own money, right? But yes, you have obligations that own money uh, uh, versus third party money being invested in your venture. But interestingly, when you uh, uh, receive such financing structures, you tend to behave more than what you envisage in terms of risk elements. Okay, okay, and and as a result, uh, your actions may detrimental uh, to the financial transaction that has already been inked. Inked means contracted and taken place between you and the financial intermediary. Okay, and also similarly when it comes to the, the so-called moral hazard behavior, depositors also do not necessarily follow what their deposits doing because they also now become complacent because they have so-called FDIC, deposit insurance structures. Otherwise, they would be worried what happens to their money. They are keeping a close eye and they will queue up in front of a financial intermediary in the morning to withdraw. 
if they see their money is not working and not put in use uh, uh, with adequate um, safeguards okay and then of course as a result of this financial intermediaries also have an incentive to take a greater risk this comes from so called principal agent problem we have discussed most of these stuff so i'm now using the words you probably know what's behind those uh, technical elements that we are highlighting then you see the adverse selection adverse selection happens when buyers have better information than sellers and so the highest cost consumers end up buying a particular uh, product okay so here the adverse selection happens uh, uh, most of the time you see uh, uh, risk lovers find uh, a pool financial structures like financial intermediation or uh, for banking remains attractive so they know it's like uh, they are actually taking a risk by getting a financial facility and investing them in activities which generate yes economic returns but interestingly when they approach towards such a a uh, a uh, 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 financial contract probably they would not necessarily uh, uh, reveal out everything that they have and the banks also would not be in a position to right uh, uh, figure it out all intentions the way in which they wanted to employ the resources that's all depends on the people who generate uh, the activity or engage in activity okay so you see the risk lovers find banking attractive and then um, as we have already highlighted depositors have little reason to monitor financial institutions because they also become complacent now so these are all possibilities in uh, uh, so called um, uh, uh, government uh, safety nets introduction so therefore you have to be very careful even when you introduce a government safety net it has a wider broader perspective of mitigating Uh, many undesired effects of financial markets by introducing safety nets but at the same time uh, uh, because of the complacent because of the moral hazard because of the adverse selection possibilities safety nets also become a uh, 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 detriment to effective uh, 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 monitoring and and effective utilization of resources in the financial markets another element of um, Uh, a government safety net is so called too big to fail concept too big to fail this financial intermediary is doing very bad their books are very much of uh, uh, deteriorated but still somebody is looking after this financial intermediary simply because it is too big to let it fail because it has roots in all the economic engagements in a, a country for instance right so the magnitude of the financial intermediary itself prevents uh, uh, effective implementation of um, regulations or supervision for that matter or imposition of penalties many many regulatory concepts then many regulatory considerations been uh, kept on uh, pause uh, simply because the institution is too big okay so in such circumstances invariably what happen is government provide guarantees of repayment of large uninsured creditors of the largest financial institutions even when they are not entitled to this guarantee so effectively what it says is because you are too big and uh, we will not let you fail the the depositors creditors they have become much more complacent of course their money is not effectively working it would have been much more productively used if that has gone to a, a financial intermediary who are just started or up and coming right so but unfortunately being in this big uh, uh, too big uh, financial intermediary they have the complacency that the government guarantees it would not let you fail so you become complacent on uh, uh, that circumstances alone okay but in such circumstances these agencies when they uh, uh, in trouble or they are almost uh, about to fall like 
the government or the regulators often try to use so-called purchase and assumption methods, right? So they do not let it to fail, but what they do is they basically look at uh, your uh, books and other obligations and these being uh, uh, structured in a way somebody else in the market being uh, taken over your operation and let it to run with some uh, assumptions being introduced. Let's say you are not allowed to withdraw deposits for certain duration. Uh, additional incentives being not provided. There are various ways of uh, accommodating these purchase and assumptions. Okay, and from another perspective, uh, uh, this too big to fail also increase the moral hazard uh, uh, simply because uh, big banks think, yes, there's a good father, he would look after us so that itself an incentive for these big banks to take unnecessary risks, right? Beyond their capacity, they take risks because they are com complacent that somebody else would look after them. Government would not let them fail, right? There are various uh, interpretation for this type of arrangements. And now most of the countries, what they are trying to do is when they see financial institutions become too big to uh, uh, handle and operate, they try to uh, 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 segregate their operations into specialized areas and introduce different um, uh, uh, agencies or institutions. So through which they try to kind of manage too much concentration of uh, financial intermediaries and it's becoming too big to uh, kind of manage in an economy. Okay. So then another aspect uh, in terms of uh, safety net is uh, there is another element to, to kind of uh, uh, avoid uh, financial intermediaries being fail or weak financial institu institutions being uh, 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 accommodated in the financial market through uh, uh, consolidation with a strong financial intermediary. Effectively, what you are doing is now you are, uh, instead of uh, addressing the problems of a small financial intermediary, maybe it is very difficult to address. So in such circumstances, you create a bigger monster by amalgamating this financial intermediary with already established big market player. Yes, that solved the small market players problems and let financial markets to continue its operation. But this itself create larger and more complex financial organizations. And these organizations at times challenge the regulations. Okay, so this invariably increase so-called too big to fail problem, okay? So it also extends safety net to new activities, okay? Increasing further incentives for risk taking in these areas. And, and this was to some extent uh, uh, visible as what has happened uh, during um, the global financial crisis where the smaller components of financial intermediation in US like mortgage, subprime mortgage institutions started amalgamating its activ activities with bigger players. And as a result, the bigger players have become much more bigger. And when the problems happen, not only the big ones, even the small one, sorry, the, not only the small ones, the big ones also started feeling the pain of financial crisis, but governments not let them except few like, uh, you know, Lehman Brothers, AIG, very few others being prevented from collapsing by government intervention. Right. So invariably financial consolidation is good. Financial consolidations look after certain specific considerations, but unfortunately, it also creates so-called too big to fail financial intermediaries when you try to kind of amalgamate weak institutions with solid big financial intermediaries. So this is another element that's being looked at uh, in financial market very seriously in today's uh, context, right? So another way of uh, introducing uh, regulations is so financial intermediaries being asked to uh, uh, select 
and uh, and restrict their asset holdings anyway the financial intermediaries has uh, uh, a restriction on ownership limits i mean there's a single owner limits most of the time these single owner limits been revisited on a regular basis by financial regulators based on overall market developments market conditions they might let uh, uh, a single owner limits been uh, uh, adjusted if not uh, breached uh, uh, for very specific reason but those were on case by case basis for instance even in the case of sri lanka uh, uh, when it comes to financial intermediaries there is a general uh, limitation uh, of single ownership up to 10% and beyond 10% under very strict circumstances up to 20% is uh, given but with special um, uh, uh, consideration generally beyond that they would not facilitate but there are circumstances uh, for instance uh, you might have uh, heard at one point union bank had a big uh, foreign investor right he is taking over 70% of stake that is to inject capital as well as bring in foreign capital into the uh, market so been facilitated but they also been asked to gradually pay off their ownership right diversify their ownership and also when it comes to financial uh, intermediaries their asset holdings like subsidiaries own um, companies that they form or through group companies ownership in other similar type of uh, uh, financial intermediation been looked at right there are circumstances in sri lanka too uh, uh, pension funds insurance funds uh, uh, under a particular conglomerate been uh, kind of uh, owning many financial intermediaries through which they can bring in a kind of you know possibilities of a cartel but been looked through certain uh, restrictions been introduced in terms of uh, ownership uh, limits and uh, and other related consideration okay Uh, uh through restriction of asset holdings what you are trying to attempt is to restrict financial institutions uh, taking too much risk okay so the bank regulation always tend to promote so called diversification okay so it's diversification you don't put all your eggs in one basket you tend to put x in different ba baskets so through which you can uh, uh, in fact reduce uh, uh, a possible risk uh, elements kind of you know uh, uh, affecting the entirety of your financial intermediary so the diversification is an interesting element uh, uh, the regulators looked at and then you see uh, uh, holding limitations you sometimes prohibit complete holdings of uh, common stocks that's ownership stocks in a certain type of uh, assets so this is very interesting so similarly the capital requirements been uh, looked at you have to bring in minimum capital if you are a financial intermediary you have to have minimum capital requirements okay so similarly leverage ratios okay so leverage ratio mean to say you look at uh, Uh, a, a company's debt debt levels debt capital to ownership capital the most common leverage uh, ratios are the debt ratio and the debt to equity ratio so you look at how much debt in terms of uh, the equity right so if not complete simply you look at what's the debt ratio of the organization this shows how much uh, the ownership interest remain or how much ownership interest has diluted from the financial intermediary then you also look at uh, various uh, uh, courts in terms of basel basel is a financial regulators uh, 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 kind of a consortium uh, basel is a place in switzerland that's where they meet often for financial intermediaries uh, regulator and supervision related discussions and um, they brainstorm Uh, uh, many uh, uh, developments in the financial in the industry and and define uh, how best the regulation supervision has to evolve 
and they also look at so-called risk-based capital requirements okay so they allocate weights for certain type of assets being held in your portfolio so if you wanted to hold certain type of assets you have to increase your capital so you have to bring in more capital into the uh, financial intermediary in order to take on more riskier assets so risk based some weights being given for instance if you are holding government securities probably the risk weight is almost zero if not longer tenors would have a smaller risk weight whereas if you are holding private equities private assets probably the risk weights are higher foreign currency denominated assets probably the risk weights are higher so to kind of reduce you you possibly exposing yourself uh, to risk then uh, another element is regulatory arbitrage where the, there's a practice whereby firms capitalize on loopholes in regulatory systems okay so to circumvent uh, unfavorable regulation but yes they provide some possibilities but uh, these loopholes been also now been looked and addressed through various check and balances by the financial uh, regulators so these are the ways through which uh, you kind of you know introduce some restrictions in terms of financial intermediaries holding certain type of assets any questions right so we are seeing um, the capital requirements as we were highlighting uh, uh, capital requirement uh, the government uh, or the financial regulators uh, imp impose capital requirements as another way of minimizing so called moral hazard at financial institutions you kind of introduce uh, 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 minimum capital and also then as we were discussing risk uh, weighted capitals so if you are uh, tend to increase your asset holding in risky type of assets you have to bring in more capital through which uh, a moral hazard possibility is been addressed even the owners of financial intermediaries would try to uh, circumvent uh, regulations by establishing possibilities of uh, debt based financers being introduced to the financial intermediary rather than ownership based uh, uh, finances so they maintain a kind of you know possibility retained earnings and things like that or they distribute the profits so why not um, increase the retained earning share in such circumstances or why not uh, uh, increase the capital share uh, in such circumstances so you feel okay my more investment is now in financial intermediary so owners are mindful what the financial intermediary is doing in terms of engaging in risky business activities if you let them uh, 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 without looking at those stuff they probably maintain their ownership stake but raise more debt capital and make use of such debt capital to engage in risky business activities right so there are ways through uh, uh, that this been addressed a uh, first type is through leverage ratio we have already mentioned the amount of capital divided by the bank's total assets that's a leverage ratio okay capital divided by uh, 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 total assets to be classified i mean these are changed i mean you don't need to restrict yourself for 5% or 3% here these are uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, ballpark numbers that you are looking at but these these leverage ratios changes its uh, relative importance based on the economic circumstance okay so to mention that to be classified as a well capitalized bank uh, 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 leverage ratio must exceed 5% so at least 1/20th of a financial intermediary has to be ownership based ownership capital based so that's what 5% means right so uh, uh, anything goes below 3% like then uh, it's it looks like uh, uh, banks uh, capital is uh, less than 130 33 times of the total assets 
So you probably see there's a risky element is uh, coming in. But these weights, as I mentioned, may change based on the economic circumstances. But regulators keep a close eye on these leverage uh, ratios applied in financial intermediaries. And then second one is, as I was mentioning, risk-based capital requirement. So more risky assets you hold, more risk weights. That means you have to bring in more ownership capital into the financial intermediary. So through which uh, the capital requirements been monitored uh, by uh, uh, financial regulators. So another element in financial supervision is so-called chartering and examination. Okay, so chartering is uh, when it comes to financial proposals, financial uh, intermediaries, they wanted to introduce or get new financial intermediary licenses. So the regulators would do a chartering process. So here you screen new proposals. Okay, uh, uh, in, 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 in this circumstance, it's, it's like a new loan application, you do uh, all this screening, the chartering process to avoid the possibility of financial uh, regulators also picking a wrong party to run a financial intermediary. So that's an adverse selection to prevent adverse selection. So chartering process is a, 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 a very cumbersome uh, as at times take uh, longer durations. Yes. Uh, but it's interesting kind of element uh, in uh, in licensing process in today's financial industry. So then you do also the examination. So the examinations could be scheduled and unscheduled. And you probably see even the examinations could be on site. Other one is off site. Off site is you in your own officers, regulators in the uh, 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 regulatory uh, for instance, in the central bank itself and get all the reports, all kind of information that is off site. They don't go to the site of the financial intermediary. On site is they visit to the site of the financial intermediary, look at the books, examine the books, review the books, uh, 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 review through all the documentation available, review through all the electronic evidence available, whatever way that they could review uh, and examine the books of financial intermediary is the on-site examination process. This could be scheduled as well as unscheduled, right? So there is a calendar of examination that the financial regulators do. Uh, 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 at least uh, a financial intermediary come under the financial regulators uh, examination process at least once a year. And it's more than uh, one time in normal circumstances, but there may be unscheduled. They might all of a sudden you find they are at your doorstep. They wanted to see some of your transactions. They wanted to see some of your books. The regulators could come, right? So to monitor capital requirements and restriction on asset holding, uh, 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 they keep a close eye on these things, okay? So they look at... Uh, capital adequacy, asset quality, management, even the people who are engaged in activities. For instance, you may have a highly qualified uh, a system of um, arrangements and people, but effectively uh, 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 the, the financial intermediaries activities, operational activities run by not these people, but maybe few trainees, right? Without having much of a depth in financial market. So that's a kind of a concern. They look at all these things. Okay. So then you look at earnings, what you do with your earnings, how you kind of allocate your earnings. So are you distributing all the profits uh, irrespective of uh, future uncertainties involved, right? So you preserve part of your earnings when good times are concerned to kind of, you know, operational efficiency in bad times. So they look at all these things, the liquidity. And if you keep more liquidity, what happened is that liquidity would not necessarily bring you, bring you the required returns. So you keep more in cash form. That doesn't work for you. Okay. 
you invest them in assets or you invest them in learning processes. So that would bring you uh, a return. But interestingly, what level of liquidity you need to maintain? So in, 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 in certain difficult circumstances, how you can access further liquidity, whether you have good assets in your investment portfolio that you can pledge and uh, receive liquidity. You can go to the central bank and access central bank's open market operations window. So various ways of looking at uh, uh, these elements also being factored in today's financial intermediation. Then uh, sensitivity to market risk. So what happened when the interest rates rise? Interest rates rise mean asset prices decline. Higher the interest rates, lower the price. So if you are keeping um, uh, uh, collaterals of a lot of assets, which are highly sensitive to uh, uh, market risk, where the interest rates changes, then what happens to your books? You give a shock and see, right? Similarly, they look at uh, the exchange rate volatilities. So you have um, uh, big volumes of obligations uh, to the rest of the world. That means the uh, responsibilities to the foreign counterparts. So if that's the case, what happened if the exchange rate depreciate? You need additional resources. So what's the impact of such uh, depreciation by 1%, 2%, appreciation by 1%, 2%? You give a shock and see. There are various ways and various models applied by financial intermediaries to do these things. Okay, then um, you have to file periodic uh, call reports. Call reports are the reports uh, requested by the regulators. It is already established same normal reports, financial statements or special reports based on some activities requested by the uh, 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 financial regulators. For instance, uh, in recent months, they've been asked to provide uh, international trade related uh, 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 reports every day, every uh, 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 month. So they have to give and also foreign currency inflows, outflows related reports. And now there are other reports coming in in terms of financial intelligence related terrorism. Uh, finance prevention arrangements, FIU, right? Financial intelligence based uh, uh, reports. So there are various type of uh, periodic call reports. This also being requested by regulators on a continuous basis. So this is to kind of, you know, make sure the financial intermediary is functioning effectively without get, getting into unwarranted risk elements uh, in their operation. Because you probably take moral hazard decisions, too much risk because you see profit opportunities in such. But regulators would keep a close eye on your engagements to prevent you uh, uh, getting into that and exposing you to a lot of difficulties when the market start behaving against you. Right. So then assessment uh, of risk management is also another very important regulatory element where this has many important uh, 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 elements in the financial intermediaries, particularly in terms of uh, soundness of management processes. You see, it is not only the people, but also the procedures established, the, the infrastructure established, and, and how you apply this infrastructure, the various ways through which they look at how best the financial intermediary is ready to control its risks. Okay, so there are various ways uh, through which uh, these being monitored. Of course, the management, as um, we have mentioned, uh, they look at uh, the, the basic uh, requirements in terms of uh, holding certain type of posi position in the organizations, right? For instance, in treasury operations, what's the processors involved? Single trader, single treasury official, what's the limit of risk or limit of uh, transactions he can call on, whether it's a 1 million, 5 million or 10 million. So if it is beyond 10 million, 
whether it's the head of treasury or two other senior members, right? They, they look at these things and then they look at uh, 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 what type of transactions required the CEOs or the board of directors consent. What type of transactions required special AGM or AGM consent. There are various arrangements that they have established and they look at the processes, how the processes involve, whether it is simply the manual processes. You have to take the file from here to the next building or to the uh, uh, some other place uh, it, 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 that is not uh, in the same building. Or it is electronically, you can pass on this and there's a system where the electronically itself, the approvals being established. Whether the approvals are single or multiple controls. The password protections. How many passwords? How frequently passwords being uh, required to be changed? Right? How long one person can hold in a similar positions of a risky avenues in a financial intermediary? Right? requirement of compulsory annual leaves that you have to take that you completely go out from the organization others would come and sit in your desk others will do all the transaction you started then they try to figure it sometimes they might find something that the regular officer should have done but he has ignored simply because he is so close to the other party counterparty with whom he does transactions there are many, many things. And also there are systems. You can't have uh, fund transferring uh, 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 through internet or any other things like that. Big value transactions has to go through safety fund transferring systems, in, uh, including real time uh, uh, gross settlement, net, net settlement, or electronic entries of uh, holding of assets in the central depository maintained by the central bank or the government for that matter there are processes so this is very very important in any financial institution and um, the regulators look at all these things then there are various type of um, uh, 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 documentation in this process in us they have trading activities manual in sri lanka most of the time we have seen uh, operational manuals being established by financial intermediaries Okay, and uh, and and then uh, they have factored risk management uh, rating, like a rating exercise that we discussed. They also rate on the basis of uh, the risk management practices established in the organization, right? So they compare between different financial intermediaries, even within the same financial intermediary, different departments. So these are all exercises to bring in discipline and orderliness in financial intermediation okay so i'm not going to read out what's there in the trading activities manual Simil similarly you see interest rate risk limits right so when you introduce interest rate risk limits when the interest rates move interest rates are not static it is a dynamic variable it's changes with market uh, 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 activities market information right so when the interest rates change the relevant elements that's bringing to your financial statements financial assets is huge so what policy is being introduced if the interest rate increases by two percentage points decreases by two percentage point what you do is there an automatic trigger of selling or buying or it's an automatic trigger prompting your senior management to report to the board of directors. Right? There are various uh, interest rate risk limits being introduced. Single uh, trader limits in terms of interest rate decisions. Okay, So you go in the night uh, closing your operation, but globally the markets are operating for 24 hours. It's not your market may close, but in other markets, it's trades, right? When you engage in international treasuries, that happens. So then what happens? During the night, when the market started moving in, maybe something due to 
natural disaster, maybe due to an election outcome, maybe due to unexpected finding, right? Or even for a pandemic like COVID-19 that we are going through now. Okay, what type of uh, elements play in terms of uh, decisions here? The management decision, how the monitoring being established, how the stress testing, value at risk were, you give shocks, you give stressors to your assets and see whether my assets are still uh, 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 holding on or it's meltdown. So you see those stuff, right? So when the interest rates changes by 3%, what happens to your portfolio? Depreciate by, currency depreciate by 5%, what happened to your portfolio? So all being looked at and then you bring in interest rate risk limits for operational uh, uh, arrangements guidelines in the uh, institution itself right any questions okay then you see disclosure requirements <laughs> You have to disclose information. You are a financial intermediary. You work with other people's money. Right? So you require, and if you have listed, your requirements are again on the basis of uh, listing uh, 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 regulators. For instance, if it is a stock market, you probably see uh, securities, securities and exchange commissions come and play a role. So you, you require to kind of disclose uh, your uh, a certain uh, information. You have to practice uh, accounting standards. You can't have accounting on the basis of your whims and fancies. You have to practice standard accounting principles and, uh, and periodically you have to publish audited, non-audited, right? So within certain duration, you have to publish this uh, details right so then you see different uh, 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 arrangements uh, uh, Basel II Accord, SEC regulations then um, the Oxley Act these are all like you know the the precise guidance given by some of the laws introduced in US and uh, in other parts of the world so you don't need to remember these names but what you have to remember here is you see that uh, minimum information disclosure is required so those are either governed through uh, elements of these um, uh, uh, regulations or legislation or for that matter even listing arrangements so then you see uh, uh, mark to market you have to mark to market uh, your portfolio you have liabilities you have assets in your books every day you see what happens to your portfolio when the interest rates, exchange rate, other collateral values changes? What happened to your portfolio? You should have a system. So now you have uh, ready-made uh, uh, systems available. Uh, you can just uh, uh, flood some of these numbers uh, into one location. So that takes into account uh, the, the evaluation exercises and brings you uh, reports every day they bring these reports and look at it so this is like you know uh, requirements in terms of uh, regulators they would see how uh, effective your processes and how uh, sound your uh, uh, diversification or the asset distribution or liability exposure so these are the elements that the financial intermediaries requires to closely monitor to make sure that you are not falling into unnecessary risks then you see consumer protection now you see uh, uh, financial intermediaries also has to look after their clientele uh, 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 very seriously because there are ombudsmen now in in different financial intermediary related systems there are ombudsmen and also for instance even in the case of sri lanka and now the central bank has uh, 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 introduced a new department for consumer protection, right? You can complain. 
if you have problems with your financial intermediary or you have already uh, looked at certain uh, financial intermediary related consideration and you have written to them you requested them still no action being taken you can follow up with the uh, uh, this particular department uh, now operational in the central bank so you can visit central bank website and you can read the purposes of establishment of this department that's very important right so this department uh, will look into and follow up with a particular financial intermediary if the financial intermediary is not forthcoming with their observations right so what basically it's trying to do is uh, to make sure the consumers are protected fairly treated equally uh, uh, facilitated in terms of credit extension okay and also uh, 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 the, it has been uh, 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 very much understood during the financial crisis that you should not mislead um, the, the, the people who come to obtain services from financial intermediaries by merely highlighting one directional possibilities of uh, assets behavior. Assets behave both ways, increases in value, decreases in value, and what happens at times of decreases, all kind of things need to be illustrated and highlighted to the consumer. So this, in a way, to protect the consumer more in terms of regulations in today's context. And, and further on this regulation aspects, you also look at restrictions on com competition. Financial intermediaries could go on and compete, but then, uh, right, increased competition can also increase moral hazard. Simply because you increase the competition that would lead to uh, uh, undercutting. That means you somehow try to compete to win by uh, not letting others to have a fair go in the market. That's why you limit ownership. You can act uh, uh, in collaboration and drive the market in favor of your assets, right? So there are limitations being introduced on these basis for competition because you might uh, uh, in, go on competing and thereby increasing the moral hazard by taking unwarranted, unnecessary risks only by looking the profit opportunities. So there are elements like branching. Branching means number of branches in operation. But today, uh, financial regulators would not seriously look at uh, whether you want a branch or not, because today the uh, technology is such that you can operate without uh, physically having a branch being established. So this Glass-Steagall Act, uh, you don't need to uh, 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 remember the name, but go and Google and see that also introduce number of measures in US in terms of uh, uh, a competition between counterparties. Okay, so restricting competition also have disadvantages. One is the higher consumer charges and other thing is efficiency consideration. So you let competition to uh, prosper through which you bring in efficiency. There is no argument with that. But as we were highlighting, sometimes uh, through uh, uh, competition, you may corner the market. You might not necessarily uh, uh, take into account um, other requirements, including uh, CSR, uh, environmental, all kind of considerations now uh, give priority in business environments. So this also some aspect in uh, competition in today's uh, elements and another very important consideration in financial regulation is so-called macro prudential versus micro prudential supervision micro versus macro you know microeconomics you know macroeconomics very similar here in terms of supervision elements so before the global financial crisis uh, regulatory authorities engage in micro supervision, micro prudential supervision, where you focus uh, on the safety and soundness of the individual financial institutions. Even today, 
yes they look at the individual financial institution but not only from individual financial institutions per se they look at so called macro prudential uh, uh, supervision where uh, uh, the focus is soundness of the financial system in aggregate for instance if all the financial intermediaries in sri lanka is exposed to external borrowing external financing right you look at bank a bank c bank d fine you have the problem but as a whole you look at the entire financial industry what happen if you are too much exposed to the external financers your balance sheets would uh, start wobbling if your exchange rate go wrong so the overall aspect there is at such circumstances you try to manage new exposure into foreign exchange obligations so you try to manage regulators would look at it similarly what happen if everybody is too much lend into real estate market agriculture sector if a drought happens agriculture business would go down so then the farmers whoever who bought a uh, uh, financial facilities would not honor all financial industry would be in difficulty so you probably limit in aggregate the entire financial intermediaries exposure into real estate uh, um, agriculture based on the possibilities uh, those uh, type of assets bring into the your books so you see the micro prudential macro prudential requirements become very important in today's context and 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 to great extent uh, uh, this has been uh, uh, one of the areas where they look at possible signals of asset bubbles also in today's um, uh, uh, financial regulation and supervision you see how much lending has gone into a certain type of asset class and as a result that asset prices behavior right if it is too much of a lending driven of course what happens once the lending stops into this uh, 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 this segment they look at all these things so in today's uh, regulation supervision per se macro prudential consideration has become very very important over and above micro prudential requirements but this does not mean you stop micro prudential supervision no you do but you at the same time look at the aggregate exposure of the industry into certain type of uh, asset classes through which you can monitor what type of exposure the the industry is uh, 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 all in terms of uh, the kind of you know economic activities that they have engaged in and even when you introduce policies you keep a close eye on this right when everybody is exposed to tourism lending what happens when tourism all of a sudden uh, collapse no no tourist uh, because of uh, pandemic until the vaccination roll out and the global tourism returns to normalcy there are challenges so how they look at the policies for such transportation right fast food industry condominiums various type of things you look at from a macro prudential perspective there are a number of examples you can bring in and analyze these things in today's context right and here i'm just listing few uh, major financial legislation in us so you don't need to remember them but when you have a leisure time you can uh, uh, go and try to uh, 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 read some of these stuff at least to get a kind of a feeling how the financial intermediation been looked at in major financial markets okay so this page also reflects some of these uh, in uh, in us but interestingly with all these uh, regulations and all these efforts by regulators still you see the bank failures and bank failures peaked again 
towards uh, financial crisis in US uh, in terms of uh, the 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 number of banks you look at here there are various uh, banks in US in terms of national banks state banks that failed uh, especially during uh, the financial crisis period but interestingly from uh, mid 80s to early 90s there's another push simply because the interest rates also started increasing in us so then um, naturally you see uh, 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 bank failures started uh, decreasing because there is much more flexibility in opening and uh, uh, functioning in us in terms of both national banks and state banks state is within the pro provinces if not in us there's a collection of states in sri lanka probably you can compare them with provinces so here you don't have provincial like arrangements there's a, there's a element in regional development banking in sri lanka from a provincial perspective but uh, that also ultimately from a centralized uh, arrangement uh, uh, in terms of uh, financial intermediation and regulation so you have to see although you have this regulation in place that does not mean banks are not uh, failing that they could fail at any time the risks are such so that's why you have to make sure your risk exposure is managed okay and then you see uh, uh, the the up, up until recently how the the bank failures and total assets uh, 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 of these uh, banks who failed during uh, the periods uh, in uh, in uh, in us for instance uh, uh, towards financial crisis it peaked uh, to 150 odd banks and the assets were close to about 400 billion dollars sri lankan economy is 85 billion dollars okay so recently what you are basically seeing is uh, uh, it is uh, very small uh, in terms of uh, the numbers as well as assets it's 4 and 214 million uh, uh, in terms of assets right so you can see these elements okay so these are some examples of uh, banking crisis at different periods uh, in the history okay in 80s uh, saving and loan banking crisis happened in the uh, us right and uh, and then you see they have introduced uh, reforms uh, and enforcement related laws in us uh, towards latter part of 1980s and 19 early 1990s and then uh, 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 the concern is while all these been introduced again you see the banking crisis uh, all over again i mean this um, is again to say when you have deposit insurances uh, uh, that's not to blame for some of these uh, newer banking crisis okay a common feature of some of these crises is the existence of a government safety net still with the government safety net yes banks were failing okay but governments uh, start ready to stand ready to bail out uh, some of these financial institutions as what we have experienced in recent recent times uh, not only in us but across the globe uh, in terms of measures that they have introduced even in sri lanka uh, uh, there are some some financial intermediaries whose deposits are guaranteed by the government right so here too we have a deposit insurance arrangement up to a certain uh, value the deposits are guaranteed right so this is how the things are then you see the picture here uh, uh, the problem since 1970s where the oil price shock and things like that uh, then the systemic banking crisis episodes of non-systemic banking crisis no crisis it's very very difficult to kind of you know say it's no crisis but the circumstances is their financial systems are somewhat uh, different in terms of and then uh, uh, the, the cost in terms of uh, bailing out many times the financial crisis happened and uh, 
uh, how much resources they require to kind of you know bail them out in terms of share of GDP. It's massive sometimes, more than half of a GDP. And then the repetitive problems. It's not happened and uh, 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 kind of, you know, dusted off. No, it repeats and it comes back to you. And these are the bills that I was mentioning, uh, introduced in US. So you can uh, generally have a look here. Uh, uh, remember these are also introduced to kind of further protect these financial intermediaries in terms of its operation. And, and uh, dot franc bill is very important in US case. And that introduces protection and regulation in, in five specific areas. And, and these were all uh, we have discussed uh, at uh, uh, different times, except Walker Rule. Walker Rule is uh, one of the US Federal Reserve Chairman's name is Walker. And he has broadly introduced an interest rate related rule into operation. Okay, uh, uh, and then um, they have uh, 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 regulations that they are looking at that needs attention in the future. The financial intermediary driven regulation that requires attention in terms of capital requirement, right? Whether it's a risk based, risk -based capital requirement uh, or whether it is asset based uh, capital requirement or weighted structures. It's, it's on a kind of a continuous evaluation, evolution and compensation strategies. You don't pay out all profits in a single financial year. You have to protect some of the uh, uh, profits uh, for the future and also compensation for the people who manage. That's to prevent so-called principal agent problems. People aggressively take moral hazard or risk positions in order to kind of, you know, bring in more uh, income earnings, expecting they will have a higher bonus and things like that. So what practices is best? Human resource related consideration has to be brought in. So then the government sponsored too big to fail, right? Considerations in a uh, financial intermediate intermediation. Then the credit rating agencies, credit rating agencies, they look at the soundness of financial intermediaries and other agencies. But unfortunately, during the financial crisis, they also fail. They also fail to read the challenges and the risks of these financial intermediaries. So how best credit rating agencies being looked at? Right? Are they just following standard models or looking at dynamic models that reflects with market developments? Then what's the problem of overregulation? You can't have everything being regulated. You need to have competition also facilitated. So whether you are doing uh, a regulation uh, to facilitate or whether you are introducing regulations to further derail the financial intermediation. So these are also arguments. I mean, you should not necessarily look regulation only from a perspective it is to enhance the safety and soundness of the financial system. But at the same time, that also prevents some financial efficiency in terms of uh, competition and things like that. So you had to actually bring in a balance. So this is how we looked at this particular section. Any questions before I stop here and move to the uh, uh, a new topic that uh, we are trying to start discussing today? Right. So we will be moving to the central banks and the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve is the US central bank. Uh, uh, what this means is we are heading towards very much the business end uh, of this program. So most likely uh, uh, in few lessons, uh, maybe three, 
lectures like we might need to complete our uh, uh, course uh, for this semester. So we are moving in that direction with uh, this. I, I have taken out few areas from discussions given the time factor and all. But what is interesting here is you are seeing the central banks here and, and then the related engagement in terms of how central banks uh, 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 functions in uh, 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 today's financial markets and what's their roles and things like is discussed. So what is interesting here is uh, uh, among the most important players in any financial markets, you will find the central banks as the, the prominent agency. Central banks could be called as central banks or monetary authorities or reserve banks or whatever. The names could sound uh, with uh, different perspectives, but what's the role that they play in any financial market is that they are the, uh, 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 the, they are the agencies who in fact perform the monetary policy operations. They are the responsible agencies in terms of uh, monetary policy operation in any country. Okay, so the actions of these central banks, in fact, uh, influence major economic variables, particularly the interest rate, the amount of money, credit available in the economy, then the, the movements in money supply, okay, through increase or decrease uh, in money supply uh, through open market operations okay all of these activities have direct impact not only on the financial market but interestingly it influences the overall aggregate output that means the uh, economy's total assets at any given moment of time and the price level that is the inflation so you can see that central banks being the supreme institution in financial markets in any country uh, their role concentrate in performing monetary policy and particularly their actions are influencing overall macroeconomic variables through which not only the financial markets but also the overall output in the economy as well as the price levels get uh, influenced right to understand this role they play in financial markets and the overall economy we have to give a little insight into how these organizations the central banks work interestingly who controls these central banks and uh, what determine their actions and what motivates the central bank's behavior, right? And then the different arrangements through which uh, the central banks derive its uh, operational authority, the power. That requires some insights for you to understand these things. So I'm not necessarily trying to kind of uh, teach you something you would learn in a central bank program. That you will do and everybody will talk what's the objectives we will just rush on touch the objective and we will go on but interestingly beyond that what's there that's what important in terms of this program to understand okay so in this section we look at the institutional structure of major central banks particularly the fed reserve okay that remains the most important central bank in today's context anything fed reserve does the entire financial market waits for the fed reserve's policy decisions and and the movement that the fed reserve hints the expectation in terms of their expected monetary policy uh, uh, actions the markets move markets change market interest rates changes and that has huge repercussions in terms of global financial flows, asset prices, your own balance sheets, your own wealth, right? So many countries 
could go bust. Many countries could become rich overnight as a result of uh, the possibilities of the Federal Reserve's decisions. But interestingly, the countries keep a kind of, you know, leverage to kind of uh, behave in line with the possibilities of uh, a, a central bank action. Okay. So we look at this uh, uh, focusing on the formal institutional structure of the Federal Reserve and then examine uh, more relevant informal structures uh, that determines where the true authority or the power within the Federal Reserve uh, 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 concentrate. And similarly, we also look at Sri Lanka's case, Sri Lanka Central Bank of Sri Lanka, and how the the kind of decision making and the authority being vested upon the operations of monetary policy. Okay, so for understanding these things, you will be able to kind of get a fee. Okay, and similarly, some other central banks, European ECB, European Central Bank, uh, since the Euro, Eurozone was introduced, then you see Bank of England, Bank of Japan, Bank of Canada, Reserve Bank of India. I mean, major central banks in the world. You get a kind of a little feel in comparison to US Fed Reserve in our discussions. Right. So the Fed Reserve system and its origin. In US, you know it's a, a kind of a arrangement where it's a United States. There are a number of states in US, right? They have their own function functionalities within the states uh, of its operation. But they get united from a, a centralized perspective for certain activities. So the central bank is one of them, but at the very beginning, they did not like establishment of a central bank because they feared the centralized power. They, they don't want to lose their aut autonomy and authority at different states, right? So they don't want to get into a centralized arrangement where they would not necessarily have their decision making and autonomy. And also they distrust the moneyed interest because ultimately it's all finances and they distrust even believing their neighboring state in terms of moneyed interest because they might not work for your betterment but their own betterment in terms of uh, economic interest and money interest uh, uh, in, in this sense. So because of this reason they haven't had a fallback like lender of last resort. They haven't had no lender of last resorts. At times of major financial problems that they have encountered in the history. Okay, so you have seen even today, the US have bank panics, bank failures. But they had these nationwide bank panics on a regular basis in the history. Prior to 1900s, the, the US financial system at different states, if you go through and read the general descriptions uh, 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 in, uh, in the internet, you probably find the bank failures and related repercussions all throughout US at different intervals in the history. But interestingly, 1907 panic, right, contributed to a kind of a movement where public was now convinced. In 1907, they have convinced the central bank is needed in US at least to protect the financial panics and nationwide bank failures in the form of a lender of last resorts because most of the problems US faced in the history was liquidity driven. They have borrowed, they have financed through deposits. These deposits are reasonably short term in duration, let's say one year, two year, but they have loaned out these funds for big massive 
projects in US that needs many years, 10, 15, 20 years in operations to bring in return. So they, when the depositors wanted money back, they were not in a position to pay them or honor them on time. So this has panicked and they recognize these are mostly liquidity driven and they require somebody to facilitate uh, in such circumstances. And they were convinced now that they require a central bank. So that's how initial background for establishing a central bank was uh, 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 erupted in the uh, US. And then uh, the US uh, Congress uh, actually facilitated the Fed Reserve creation by Fed Reserve Act only in 1930. It's, it's about uh, 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 less than 110 years now. Sometimes uh, your schools might be older than that. Right? So you see, and compared to Bank of England, it's, uh, it's much more longer in history. Right? So you see the US Fed Reserve was established in 1913. And here, as you see, they had resistance for centralized power. So they have introduced a decentralized arrangement of power and also a system of check and balances. So the Fed Reserve Act of US facilitate in line with the requirements of US people where they looked at centralized possibilities would have uh, distrust. So they wanted to have a decentralized arrangement of operations in US. And as a result, they have brought in a, a number of uh, features which are very unique in terms of US Fed Reserve's operation with check and balances. So how the structure of Fed Reserve system? Right. So they wanted to diffuse the power centralizing by introducing regional arrangement of authority in the act itself. And then they do not want to let it concentrate only among the government. So the power was diffused along regional lines between private sector and the government and the bankers, business people and the public. So it's a mixture of all stakeholders in the system itself. Okay. So the initial diffusion of power has resulted in the evolution of the Fed Reserve System, where three, particularly three, very important entities was uh, established. And that remains the focal and main operational centers in the US central banking system. So you see Fed Reserve Banks, so when I say Fed Reserve Banks, you might now get a kind of a feeling along regional lines. There may be many banks in US, Federal Reserve Banks. Yes, they have many banks numbering to 12 Fed Reserve Banks in US. Effectively, 12 central banks in the United States of America. Then you see the Board of Governors of the Fed Reserve System. This is the centralized decision-making body. And then you see the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee. These three, Fed Reserve Banks, the Board of Governors and the FOMC remain the most influential institutions within the Fed Reserve System. In addition to that, you have an advisory council comprised of many stakeholders playing a very important role and bring, uh, in, in terms of advising the policy making in the US. And then the member banks, 
and and all these Federal Reserve banks are owned by private, public, government businesses in that territory. So there are a number of uh, member banks in the U.S. system, and we will get into those in details. Any questions before I move on? Right. So you see this uh, arrangement and you see the structure and responsibility for policy tools in the Fed Reserve System. This is very interesting as well as very important uh, chart for you to understand how the Fed Reserve mainly operate. Right. When you say Fed Reserve System, I said three main element board of governors fed reserve banks fomc federal open market committee these three remains the cornerstones of operation in us then you see advisory councils and member banks they also are important that also bringing the influence on the basis of regional lines into the fed reserve system but understand here you see, the Board of Governors are the most influential group of policymakers amounted to seven in the Fed Reserve System. This includes the chairman. Chairman is uh, from another parlance. You can call it the governor, right? In the case of uh, uh, Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Or you can call it chairman in the monetary board of the central bank of sri lanka so the board of governors in uh, us has seven members the monetary board which is the supreme authority in terms of monetary law act in sri lanka has five members in us board of governors has seven in sri lanka five including the chairman in the case of U.S., chairman is uh, chairman of the Fed Reserve System. In Sri Lanka, the chairman of the monetary board is the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. And appointed by the president of the U.S. And requires to confirm by the Senate. The seven members are appointed by the president and uh, confirmed by the the Senate. In the case of Sri Lanka, you have five members. The governor is appointed by the president at the advice of the minister in charge of the subject of finance. Then uh, in the case of Sri Lanka, one member is the secretary to the treasury by holding the position of secretary to the ministry of finance or the treasury he becomes a member. So the balance three members are appointed members. They have been uh, appointed by the president, but through the parliamentary uh, a select committee nomination. So interestingly, what you are basically looking at here is the board of governors in the case of US and then the Central Bank of Sri Lanka's monetary board. Then you see twelve Federal Reserve banks. Okay, so you basically see here in US it is twelve central banks distributed across regions right we will come to those uh, 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 in a nice picture i believe uh, we have that in the next slide right so these 12 fed reserve banks in us consist of nine directors right so they basically 
appoint the president and other officers of the Fed Reserve Bank to run their operations. The president is that particular Fed Reserve Bank's governor. But interestingly, you can find, right, three directors out of this nine been appointed by the seven member board of governors. So when it comes to uh, a particular districts, uh, Fed Reserve districts, uh, a central bank, nine directors are there, three of them been appointed by board of governors. And the rest, the six, been appointed by member banks. So most of the Fed Reserve banks in US are owned by members, mainly the commercial banks operating in that particular territory. So they appoint the balance. But what is interesting here is the, the 12 Fed Reserve Banks, Board of Governors and the FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee, which consists of 12 members, all seven members of Board of Governors are here. And then the presidents of five Fed Reserve Banks. But always the president of the New York Fed Reserve Bank is a member. And four others on a rotational basis become members in the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC. Why U.S. New York Fed Reserve is always a member of the FOMC? Because New York is the center of the global financial market. The Fed Reserve New York desk of open market operation makes decisions that involves trillions of dollars in every day in terms of central banks engagement with the market through which the global financial markets behave many ways. So the importance in terms of board of governors, 12 Fed Reserve Banks, Federal Open Market Committee, member banks and advisory councils. Right, advisory council is advising to the Fed Reserve Banks in each districts. Okay, M mainly selected through member banks uh, in particular Fed Reserve District itself. So they are playing advisory role. In Sri Lanka's case, we don't have a Fed Reserve Bank's branch uh, the, the, like in different provinces or territories. We have branch operations. We have branches in Sri Lanka at different places, right? Trincomalee, you have Kilinochi, you have in central province Matale, and you have uh, Matare in southern province. So you see some activities in terms of uh, provincial operations in Sri Lanka, but those are not central banks. A central bank, uh, uh, regional officers to carry out mostly the region, regional related activities or facilitate region related activities and information distribution and collection. Right? So in Sri Lanka's case, it's a six mem five member monetary board, whereas in the uh, U.S. Fed Reserve case, it's a seven member board of governors. In, in, in the case of Sri Lanka too, we have monetary policy advisory committee as well as financial system stability advisory committees. We call it consultative committees. We don't call it advisory committees. We call it monetary policy consultative committees, financial system stability consultative committees. They also meet through industry experts and they engage and in give their inputs to the decision makers, the policy makers in the central bank. But what is interesting here is the Fed Reserve systems that you see here actually makes decisions in terms of policy tools. There are three conventional, please remember, the conventional monetary policy tools anywhere in the world are falls into this three. 
One is the reserve requirement. You impose a, a reserve requirement from the deposits that you collect. For instance, in Sri Lanka, it's a 2%. 2% of the deposits the licensed commercial banks take, they need to keep with the central bank. This was 6% uh, uh, some time back. That was in 2019, but gradually been reduced. And this reserve requirement is one element through which you can actually increase, decrease, through which you can change the market quantum of money available in the financial system. But it's a one-off. Like when you introduce at one point, after that, it remains reasonably uh, uh, static. But open market operation, OMO, is the most widely used tool by central banks in terms of injecting, absorbing, directing, signaling, driving expectations in financial markets and in the macroeconomy through its operations. They buy, sell government securities or other assets through open market operations and thereby Whenever a central bank buys, they inject liquidity. Whenever a central bank sells, they absorb liquidity. Thereby, the money available in the economy changes. And the discount rate is another policy tool. The central bank's users to facilitate banks to come and finance their financing requirements from the central bank. It is in a way, yes, lender of last resort facility one could call it but there are lender of last resort very specific facilities uh, 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 beyond discount window in most of the central banks including sri lanka so what matters here is you have to see the structure and the tools how these been linked with the central bank's operation so we see the broader picture in terms of how the, the Fed Reserve System is established, how the Central Bank of Sri Lanka similarly uh, operationalized and including uh, the members in the respective decision making boards now being clear. And we will come to this point with the, the operation, how this being distributed across U.S. And, and you'll see here U.S. case we have already aware there are 12 Fed Reserve Banks and each Fed Reserve Bank is called as a Fed Reserve Bank in a Fed Reserve District. These red lines that you are seeing here are the boundaries of a Fed Reserve District. For instance, in the case of US, the West Coast here, Fed Reserve Bank is located in San Francisco. The blue dot that you are seeing here is the Fed Reserve Bank for this Fed Reserve District. This covers number of states in US. It's not a single state. Many states have one Fed Reserve Bank in San Francisco. But interestingly, the black dot says within this uh, San Francisco Fed Reserve Bank, there are branch cities, Seattle, Portland, Salt Lake, Los Angeles, you see here. So these red lines are the boundaries of a district. The blacks are the branch cities. The blue dot is the Fed Reserve Bank. And then you see, this is the West Coast, East Coast. You see number of Fed Reserve Banks. It is partly because in 1913, the global economic activities were centralized in this side of the U.S. East Coast because this is where the Atlantic Ocean is. In the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, you see the Europe, the other center of global finance. So most of the activities in terms of economic uh, engagement happens through the east coast of US and the countries around Europe here. So most of the central banks are there. You see here Boston, you see New York, 
Philadelphia, Richmond, Atlanta, you see everywhere here. And they also have some branch cities, but in some uh, uh, Federal Reserve District, no branch cities. For instance, Boston, only the central bank there. But what is interesting here is the star mark here, the Board of Governors of the Central Federal Reserve System, they sit in the Washington, closer to the political authority in Washington, D.C. So you can see here how the Fed Reserve is structured to diffuse the centralized possibilities along the lines of decentralized arrangement through Fed Reserve District in U.S. amounting to 12. And within that 12, again, they have branch cities and then the federal uh, 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 board of governors, Fed Reserve System Board of Governors, they are more or less kind of operating through decision making through the board of governors themselves as well as the open market FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee. So this structure is quite interesting and we will see something similar to this in European Central Bank, ECB, where a number of countries combined to establish a central, single central bank to the entire region, Eurozone. We will come back to that when we uh, get back to ECB. So I'll stop at this point and start next week with Fed Reserve System. So possibly uh, uh, we will try to kind of finish uh, the Fed Reserve and the central bank discussion in our next class and try to see whether we'll be able to move to the uh, money supply process uh, in, in, in discussion. So any questions before we close our discussion today? If not, uh, we'll stop at this point and please uh, start uh, revising and uh, learning your stuff now. I was told by uh, middle of April or latter part of April, the, the, the examinations also would uh, take place. So might be able to have only up to first week of April in terms of classes. Uh, and beyond that, uh, you have to study and, uh, and prepare yourself for examinations. So thank you. And we'll meet uh, next week uh, if you all don't have any questions?